huge thank you to Heather and to Sarah for organising this event um, to make it happen that actually here we are with an expert panel who are going to <laughs> no pressure no. who are going to um, respond to Pete's um, delivery of the um, of a pricey of the Stone Stonewall report LGBT in Britain and we're specifically looking at the higher education the university report and some of those findings. So Pete is the Head of Public Sector Memberships for Stonewall and this report, how many of you have actually had a chance to, to read it or to, to look at some of the key findings? Excellent, so everybody else is going to hear, hear the summary and, and have a, an in-depth conversation about it afterwards. And the reason why we're here today is because one of the top, um, the top findings that actually was distributed back in, in March this year was that two in five LGBT students felt that they'd had to hide their identities within the university sector um, and that's, uh, well, that's way, way, way too high and that's one of the re major reasons why we've come together, we've addressed or wanting to address the issues by talking about them but also most importantly trying to find a way of practically addressing some of the, the feedback and the, some of the, um, the report findings really um, because without that we're going nowhere so this is a real this is we want to hear the results but actually what we're aiming to do and what LGBTQ can at CAM is trying to do alongside um, equality and diversity at the university is put initiatives in place to ensure that this is a safe place that we no longer have to hide our identities as LGBT staff and students alike. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Miriam Lynn, I work at the Equality and Diversity at the University and I also support the LGBT staff network uh, which I'm very gladly gladly to do so. So the way that today is going to work is that Peter from Stonewall is going to give us about a 20 minute introduction to the findings from this report. Okay, so we'll whiz through many slides but keep, keep focused on what, what he's saying because then what we'll do is invite uh, other panel members um, for uh, today. So we've got Tasha who's here from um, Spanish and is a lecturer and a fellow at Jesus College. At Christ. At Christ. Yeah, one uh, of them. One of the religious. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've then got, we're very, very lucky um, to have got Rob with us um, today, who is from NUS Open Space and is an LGBT plus officer for NUS UK. So, being Welsh, I have to say that we're very glad that the NUS actually encompasses all, all countries within. So very welcome to Rob, who's come from Manchester to be here um, today. So pleased to see you here. And then we've also got D Nikki Ward, Dr. Nikki Ward from Birmingham University, who some of you might recognise from an event we ran last term, actually, um, looking at LGBT plus uh, how to make the curriculum more diverse for LGBTQ students and staff alike. So Pete will start, run us through some of the key findings, and then other members of the panel will respond, or we'll have a discussion amongst ourselves as a kind of a, a top table here, um, so to speak, and then we'll open up for the last 15, 20 minutes to a discussion from the floor. Does that sound, does that sound like the event you were meant to be at today? <laughs> on this day of World Man And if it's not, you're you trapped can, now. Yes, the doors are shut. The doors are shut. <laughs> but it is, it is World Mental Health Day today, so one of the things that I ask that we do is actually respect ourselves, actually stay true to our feelings in this, which is actually some kind of uh, devastating results, but also things that we can move on and work from together so that we respect ourselves and each other in the space, and hopefully we're all here because we want to make um, this university and this country a better place. So, Pete, over to you, thank you. Just bear with whilst I get this up. Right, thanks ever so much Miriam and um, thanks for, for inviting me here today. Um, as Miriam said, my name's Pete, I work at Stonewall. Um, British universities, uh, liberal spaces, question mark. I'm here to talk about the assumption really um, that British campuses are necessarily uh, inclusive, progressive liberal spaces. Uh, an assumption that I think is really widely held and may be true in part um, but one that I think our research debunks, so it's certainly an assumption that I want to challenge today. And to just to start this presentation, I want to look at some of the some of the qualitative um, findings from from the research before before I sort of then go back to the beginning of the presentation. 
I've recently started at a, uni a new university. I was laughed at, ridiculed, and became the butt of jokes that normally gender me as a woman. This has been since day one. My pronouns and preferred name are not used by my tutor. I've been called a, I'm not going to read this word out, or puff at the students' union on a night out. I believe it's because of loud culture from the sporting societies and the groups associated with it. The university flies for rainbow flag during LGBT History Month, but there's a real issue with discriminatory attitudes and actions in the staff team. These are just some of many, many anecdotes that we gleaned from um, the research that I'm about to go through um, today, um, which clearly show that there is still a problem. Um, but I wanted to start on these because I think it's important to re remember that we're talking about real people and real people's lives, so this is what, these are, these are people's lived experiences and what people have to go through on campuses. Can I just ask, how many of you are aware of Stonewall as, as an organisation and kind of what we do? Okay, so everyone, in that case, in the interest of time, I'm just going to whiz through all of these potentially really boring slides. <laughs> Ta-da! Okay, so let's get to it. So actually, that's probably quite important. So a lot of time we get asked at some more, you know, so many kind of legal, uh, legislative um, kind of achievements have been, have been made in, in British society in the last 30 years since Stonewall was established. Is it time to pack up and, and go home? Is it a case of job done? Absolutely not. Um, and I'm probably, I'm, well, I'm certainly preaching to the converted in that respect, um, but here's a few kind of examples of why homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia are certainly alive and kicking um, in British society, but also certainly around the world um, today. In particular, I think you'd, you'd probably have to be living under a rock to have escaped um, the kind of overwhelming um, transphobic narratives that are out in the, in the public domain at the moment, as well as in private life, obviously. Um, we've seen a horrendous amount um, of incredibly transphobic headlines over the last um, few years in response to, I guess, what is greater um, visibility and awareness, perhaps, of trans identities. Um, but the, the British press has not been sympathetic um, to trans equality and trans um, identities, and we've seen we've seen some some awful headlines that kind of. Um, Take us back to perhaps a few decades ago, sometimes quite similar kind of narratives around children protectionist um, so-called arguments um, that we might have witnessed, say, 30 years ago um, in response to um, LGB equality and identities, um, and, and particularly gay men. So these are some of the articles that we've kind of seen um, over the last few um, decades. And we'd love to say that that has kind of ended and that all of that is over, but it's sadly not. So some of some of these kind of um, tabloid headlines pertain and pervade through to this day. So just earlier this year, um, a comment article in the Daily Mail ran with an, uh, a piece called "Don't Please Don't Pretend Two Dads Is The New Normal and there was lots of controversy around um, what was uh, actually just a really good film called Call Me By My Name and ideas around suggested paedophilia when actually both of the main leads and um, characters in the story were perfectly consenting um, age. So, so we know this is kind of further proof that um, it's not just um, kind of pockets within society but there's still stuff that's going structurally within the headlines of society um, that are certainly homophobic and biphobic as well as um, clearly transphobic at the moment. So we commissioned um, this piece of research called LGBT in Britain and this is a, this is a wholesale study that looks at, um, it's basically like a state of the nation report that looks at LGBT lived experiences in all different kinds of walks of life. We run it every five years because Stonewall began its trans inclusion journey about four years ago and um, the last time we did it sadly was not trans inclusive but this one certainly was. So far there have been five reports um, released, we've just one to go which is going to be released next month um, looking at the experience of LGBT people as patients, so looking at the health sector. Um, but so far we've had, um, we've had uh, reports on um, hate crime and discrimination in the workplace, um, a trans specific report, home and communities, one on universities that I'm going to look at today and then as I said um, the next one is on health. So just really quickly to put it in wider context, so our campuses don't kind of aren't kind of in isolation, they are within broader societies obviously. So there were some really horrendous hate crime statistics that demonstrated that hate crime um, and incidents against LGBT people has actually risen um, over the last five years. 
So one in five LGBT people have experienced a hate crime or incident due to their sexual orientation and gender identity in the last 12 months. This figure rises to one in three of LGBT people who are who are BAME. The number of LGB people who have experienced a hate crime or incident in the last year because of their sexual orientation has risen by 78% from 9% in 2003 to 16% um, in 2017. Um, and you might sort of, you'd be forgiven for thinking, is that just because more people are reporting? Yes, people are more reporting, but actually, um, but actually as a proportion of the amount of hate crimes and incidents, um, it's still roughly the same. So four in five LGBT people, 81% who experience a hate crime or incident, don't report it to the police, and there's various reasons we know why. Um, at work, almost one in five LGBT staff have been the target of negative comments or conduct from work colleagues in the last year because they're LGBT. One in eight BAME LGBT employees have lost a job in the last year because of being LGBT, compared to 4% of white um, LGBT staff. So I think it's really important to think about the intersecting of, of identities here and where multiple oppressions exist. <coughs> Almost two in five bi people, 38%, aren't out to anyone at work about their sexual orientation, no one at all. More than a third of LGBT staff have hidden or disguised that they are LGBT at work in the last year because they're afraid of discrimination. Um, and that's, um, that's across all sectors um, and industries, so not HE specific. And just before I get onto the university report itself, um, we looked at um, trans-specific experiences. So two in five trans people have experienced a hate crime or incident because of their gender identity in the past 12 months. <coughs> One in eight trans employees have been physically attacked by a colleague or customer in the last year. Half of trans people have hidden their identity at work for fear of discrimination. A quarter of trans people have experienced homelessness at some point in their life. And two in five trans people are just the way they dress because they fear discrimination or harassment. This number increases significantly to half of non-binary people. Now onto the university report. One in seven LGBT students have been the target of negative comments or conduct from a member of university staff in the last year because they're LGBT. This rises to more than a third of trans students compared to 7% of LGB students who don't identify as trans. Almost one in four BAME um, LGBT students and LGBT students have experienced this in the last year, again thinking about intersectionality. Three in five trans students and more than one in five LGB students who aren't trans have been the target of negative comment or conduct from other students. LGBT disabled students are particularly likely to have been the target of such remarks from other students. Almost half of LGBT disabled students have experienced this. 7% of trans students were physically attacked by another student or a member of staff in the last year because of being trans. <coughs> Two in five trans students and more than one in five LGB students wouldn't feel confident reporting any homophobic, biphobic or transphobic bullying to university staff. More than two in five LGBT students hid or disguised that they are LGBT at university in the last year because they were afraid um, of discrimination, which is the step that Miriam referred to earlier. And one in seven trans students had to drop out of a course or, or consider dropping out of a course because of experiencing harassment or discrimination. Sorry, loads of stats going your way. Um, I don't want to gloss over any of these because I think they're all quite significant. Um, one in five trans students were encouraged to were actually encouraged by university staff to hide or disguise that they are trans. Totally unacceptable. One in four non-binary students and one in six um, trans students don't feel able to wear clothes representing their gender expression um, at university. And one in six trans students report being unable to use a the toilet they feel comfortable with at university. Really fundamental, basic human right. Um, and just thinking about, um, just wanted to sort of visualise some of these stats um, because I do think it's important to think about um, the, the context that we're operating in at the moment and where, um, and where disadvantage and oppression is kind of most pointedly experienced. When we look at that stat about um, LGBT students receiving negative comments from other students, um, you can see the disparity between um, staff, uh, students who are trans and students who are LGBT and not trans. Um, 
whoppingly different between 60% and 22%. Um, there's also um, definitely um, something quite pointed going on around buy exclusion and buy erasure um, at campuses as well. So, uh, so 34% of buy students specifically um, were excluded by other students um, compared to 18% of lesbian and gay. Um, and then we look at it from um, like a wider participation and um, socioeconomic perspective as well. Um, we'll see that students are much more likely to receive negative um, comments um, on the grounds of their sexual orientation or gender identity if they're from um, a lower income um, um, family background as opposed to um, a higher income household and um, 43% um, compared to 30%. Um, I'm aware I've just thrown a shed ton of stats at you right now um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what the other panellists are, are going uh, gonna to say in, in response to this because I think what's really important is what we do to address it. I think, I think we're clearly all aware that there is a problem now if you, went, if you didn't hold that belief um, already, hopefully you do now. Um, there are lots and lots of things that we would recommend at Stonewall to start changing some of this. Um, but just to go through some of their headlines, um, developing clear policies and training is an absolute must. We consider to that, that to be a really basic foundational element to, um, to tackling some of these, um, some of these cultures. Um, working, we also saw through the report um, that the, a lot of the anecdotes were linked to student societies and sports clubs, um, so in particular working with students' unions. Um, I mean, just in a broader sense, student voices should be critical to this work, um, obviously, but um, specifically also looking at the subcultures within um, different student groups. Um, having a particular lens on trans inclusion, um, I think we can see that within LGBT equality broadly and the experiences of LGBT students, there's clearly a deficit um, here in that respect. Um, LGBT visibility is, is super important and I'm, I think this is probably something we'll touch on um, during the discussion um, and something that there's a real healthy debate I think around. Um, and of course <laughs> we would recommend um, engaging with, with Stonewall. We currently work with around 80 universities across, across the UK um, and we work um, in constructive partnership to basically um, to um, to, to basically work with them to improve um, with some of their practical um, some of their practical things. Um, our diversity champions program is exactly the model that we do to um, do to work with universities. I won't talk too much about it, but we currently work with about 800 um, employees in the UK, about 80 universities. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if any of you are kind of visiting from another institution and you don't work with Stonewall, obviously come, come speak to me, that would, that would be really good. Um, we also have a variety of um, public campaigns. We believe in, um, in focusing on public narratives as well and, um, and winning hearts and minds. Um, so we've, run, we've launched a, a campaign called Come Out for LGBT. Um, within the current climate, we've also got um, a branch about called Come Out for Trans Equality, which is particularly pertinent right now um, with the Gender Recognition Act um, consultation currently being live, although about to close in one week. And just to finish, I just want to say a few things about GRA. Um, so if, if you're not aware, um, the government is consulting on how it might um, change um, legislation related to changes of legal gender. Um, Stonewall supports this um, consultation and sees it as an opportunity. Um, it is, it is by no means the only thing that needs to be addressed with regards to trans equality, but there's a, there's a window of opportunity here. These are the kind of things that Stonewall will be, um, or, well, has already responded um, to the consultation on, and we'll be encouraging our partners to do the same. Um, as I say, it closes in about a week, um, so if you want to make your voice heard on the GRA, please do submit to that consultation. Um, we also provide some advice and guidance, so we've, got, um, we've actually got a form embedded on the Stonewall website, so if you respond to our online form, it feeds directly into the government um, consultation, and we break it down by each question and give sort of the Stonewall position on, on, what, um, on what our answers would be for, for each of those questions. Um, so please consider um, responding that, to that consultation because um, it, it's hugely important and will influence um, policy and decision making. I think that's it. I'm not going to take questions, am I, because we're going to go to I think let's go panel. St straight to panel and then we can hold your questions because I'm sure you've got lots to do. But thank you, Pete, for that. Round of applause to Pete. <laughs>
Thank you. So, I'm now going to hand over to the fabulous panellists, and I, I think I'm going to start with Nikki, actually. <laughs> and then we'll go along the line in terms of any immediate responses. I'm sure you've already digested the report um, beforehand in, in your capacity as um, Birmingham LGBT, yes, super, something, something super, superhero, superhero, <laughs> diversifying <laughs> career, superhero. Um, yeah. No, thank, thanks, Pete. I think um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the report, I was really pleased to see a, a national report of that sort, because up until then there'd been sort of pockets of action. Um, and although you were sort of saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'll throw lots of statistics at you, actually one of the things we found at Birmingham is that those statistics can be particularly powerful in convincing people who maybe are less wanting to be convinced about the need to respond. So I think those statistics can be really powerful just to... Um, you, can I just ask you to speak up? Sorry. Yeah. So this discussion, although it is yeah, for the panel, sorry. it is for the ears of those at the back of the room. Sorry. That's um, okay. I think just to select a few things of what you've said that, that appear to me to be perhaps the most important and sometimes the most difficult things to address. The, the, the really significant aspect for me is both the level of discrimination and oppression faced, but even more so the lack of confidence that our LGBTQ students have in reporting those issues and the reluctance to report those issues because they actually think we're not. And when I say we, I mean us as, as faculty, as staff of the universities, are not going to respond to those, to those issues or worse, think that actually will reinforce that discrimination. And, and that for me is, is probably one of the biggest issues. And you rightly said, so the, the question then is, how do we address that? What do we do about it? Um, I think in most universities, in my experience, there are some real pockets of good practice going on. They tend to be led by colleagues who themselves identify as LGBTQ or, or identify as allies to the LGBT community. We often joke a little bit at Birmingham with my colleagues about having a day job and a gay job. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the bits of the gay job are around trying to promote those aspects, but that, that can only take us so far. And I think the biggest issue is around getting change at an organisational level, both in terms of the, the organisation, but also its procedures and the sort of bureaucracy. And, and one particular example of that is around trans students and issues around pro, pronouns and preferred names. Um, when we did a, the first bit of work we did at Birmingham, which we started in 2014, so some time ago now, one of the first things we tackled organisationally was to talk to our, our student administration team centrally about making sure that students could register their preferred names and not be misgendered because once it's on the university system, every time <coughs> you print a register off or a class list off, that name comes through and we thought we'd cracked it. Um, one of the other bits of work that we've started is to develop a widening horizons module which is open to all students and yesterday I got an email from one of the students who's enrolled on that module which this year saying I notified the university way before I started what my name was and my preferred name was and they're still using the name that's that appears I guess on the birth certificate. I don't even know where they've got it from because this student is saying this was way before they started university. So tackling some of those things alongside increasing visibility and inclusivity at sort of face-to-face -face level with students I think is incredibly important. Um, and uh, just to one more thing I'd like to say, Pete, you talked about um, signing up to Stonewall and that being a symbolic commitment and, and, and it is a symbolic commitment but actually it's also something we have found incredibly useful as a bit of leverage at some of the higher levels of our university because they do submit to the Stonewall workplace um, 
one top 100 um, or aim to be in the top 100 and actually using that with some people at higher levels of the organisation to try and push the agenda forward. So, so not just symbolic but also as a bit of leverage if you need it I think can be incredibly useful. Thank you very much Nikki. Rob, from a student perspective, um, is there anything that you'd like to put to the discussion in terms of response? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so, as it was said, um, I work for the National Union of Students and I represent LGBT plus students specifically. Um, and in 2015 we actually also did a bit of research into the experiences of LGBT plus students. Um, and something that we looked at was um, particularly how um, LGBT plus student spaces on campus can provide really vital support both like politically and in terms of welfare for those students. Um, and we actually found that, um, amongst other things, we, I don't want to also like throw loads of statistics at you, um, that over half of the students who were applying to universities made sure that there was an LGBT society at th those universities, which in itself, like, you know, it's clear that people and particularly students and young people really need those spaces um, and I'm really interested um, like in terms of how the student movement has like a historical context in terms of providing that space for students where um, that safe space that we often can't find at our universities as, as has been evidenced in the, in the report. Um, I also want to talk about something that we've already like brought up as a theme is visibility and I think particularly as a uh, trans and like gender non-conforming person um, a lot of the conversations that we're having in the community about visibility is kind of challenging the idea that it's inherently like li libera liberatory, it's, it's not inherently linked to our like liberation as, as trans students in particular. Um, and it can be a double-edged sword and I think it's really important to acknowledge that, um, particularly for trans people of colour. Um, as you know, visibility can, can be exceptionally powerful, it can be useful, it can be really useful and like like incredible to see like out members of staff and having that rainbow flag and that trans flag out there for history month um but at the end of the day being a visibly gender non-conforming person as i am like that does lead to harassment on the street and it does lead to negative comments from my staff members and from lecturers etc so i think it's important that while we do encourage where possible um, for our institutions to be openly supportive of LGBT plus students and be open about, for example, policy, something we're also really keen to push for. Um, we also need to advocate for the like an understanding that's a bit more nuanced about both visibility as something that's inherently like the best thing and it's going to solve all of our problems. Um, and we also want to challenge the idea that you know simply having a policy doesn't always that that's not enough, and we can't simply pass some policy and like send a couple of staff members off to like a single training day and that, that's the tick box done. I think it's really important that we're embedding liberation into our staff experiences and our staff training. Um, and I want to do a shout out to the University of Salford, it's actually a really good case study if anyone's interested, um, where they've got uh, Tara Hewitt, who's a really incredible trans activist, who's training over 300 members of staff. Um, on how to be trans inclusive and this isn't just an hour session these are like good day long sessions that she's running um, and I'd really encourage you know when, when you walk away when you're having these conversations about how we advocate for trans students and LGBT plus students more broadly on campus that we make sure it isn't ever treated as a simple tick box and it's never treated as a simple you know when we send some lecturers off on a, a, a single training day so that that's done um, yeah Rob, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Absolutely massive, huge amounts of points there in terms of legislation and policy, but also in, to, in terms of how we look at harassment generally, because I think we often as a staff group get, get calls in from people saying, somebody's asked me to change, you know, to start using a different pronoun. What do I need to do? It's like, it's simple, use the pronoun that they're asking you to do. Do you know Use the pronoun that they're asking you to do, but there's so much confusion and concern around about what yes actual practical steps of, of doing things and we need to engage more as a as a body but also as allies i think that we need to raise the profile so that we're not asking any member of our community to stand up and be the the visible person who takes takes the brunt on their shoulders for, for kind of raising the flag or raising the issue so huge amount of thoughts there tasha from a university of cambridge perspective <laughs> um, um i think as, as a lot of us have said we can't can't be complacent really and I guess I'll, I'll give sort of a few concrete responses about about the particularities of this collegiate university yeah um, so I think one of the things that came to mind um, is the direct contact with students that we have within the colleges at Cambridge's directors of studies and as tutors and and supervisors 
Um, and just that there are a lot of cases, I think, where there's an assumption of family support, for example, on a very logistical basis, the fact that students often have to move out of their rooms in the vacation periods. Um, there's an assumption there that they've got someone. Progress is made at very, in very, diff very different sp speeds, um, and each person's situation is very, is very individual. So I think when we're sort of celebrating um, the, the progress that has been made, we just have to be very sensitive, um, sensitive to to those to those issues. Um, another thing that I think uh, ties in people with what you were saying about whether universities are liberal places. This can be used uh, against um, the LGBTQI plus cause. I think and um, the issue of free speech has come up um, a lot recently. Um, there's a particular case um, that, that I was dealing with uh, last academic year about you know, whether something is counted as a platform for debate mm -hmm. and whether you know, the, the idea of you know, what, what counts as, um, as hate speech versus the university being held up as a place where different opinions should be, can be expressed and uh, respected. And, and, and yeah, I, I, I just think uh, issues with kind of transphobic or homophobic speakers and this free speech being kind of thrown back at us, you know, we must be neutral, we must be objective, we must allow different perspectives to be expressed, is a very uh, pernicious um, sort of discourse that, that we're dealing with at that level. And when we're thinking about who we're inviting and, and responding to invitations that colleagues um, might make, uh, sort of how, how we deal with those. Um, so just being a liberal place is not necessarily always a, a, a good thing um, in, in, in that sense. Um, and then the final thing, I suppose, as a, as a lecturer and, and supervisor in uh, tying in with the visibility that um, a, a lot of the panellists have mentioned, um, and think, thinking about curriculum, really. I think often when, what my, my personal experience of introducing kind of more uh, queer uh, topics into curricula is that sometimes you, and, and this is the same with, with I think, issues of uh, gender and, and race and well, across, across the board with these sort of kind of diversity themes, is that often you get these options brought in uh, for, and it's often students that identify with these issues that will then come to the courses. So you end up having this kind of preaching to the converted thing, like, you know, all the brilliant events that um, uh, Heather and Sarah are, are organising, often we know the people coming are already on, on board. Um, so I think that's the same with students. So I've kind of been really pushing to get a lot of these issues into the core, you know, into the core curriculum, rather than the sort of opt-in, if you want to do this queer topic, come, come to this lecture. Um, just so, um, you know, we can have some of these difficult discussions, perhaps with, uh, you know, and, and deal with, with some uh, students that perhaps um, don't, don't, aren't already aware of, aware of these issues, and, and as supervisors kind of support some of these discussions, so that, uh, sorry, I hate using Cambridge terminology, as uh, teachers and lecturers kind of support um, the, these discussions between students so that students don't feel that they're having, if there is kind of discrim discriminatory um, comments being made, that they feel kind of supported in, in addressing those issues rather than kind of being left to, to deal with them alone. And I think we can do that in the classroom as well as in other more informal ways. Um, so those, those would be my main initial uh, responses from, the from reading and uh, from hearing Pete. And hearing Pete. Yeah, yeah, Thank you very much, all three of you, and for Pete in particular. Pete, is there anything you'd like to add at this point before we open up to a um, discussion from the floor? Oh, God, yeah, there's loads. To, I mean, uh, <laughs> so much. You know, I, I like, I 100% agree with literally everything that has just been said. Um, I think, I think. I think the free speech argument, or, or academic freedom as it's mm -hmm. sometimes um, labelled, is a really important one. Um, I think I'm, I'm, like, there's a lot of like really lightweight <laughs> like academic debate about about this and about the like limits of free speech. But, uh, universities are talking about free speech as though uh, and free speech has always been this untethered thing throughout their whole of history, and that's not true. Like there have have and always will be consequences um, to speech and. And when we're talking about free speech, we're actually not usually talking about academic freedom, we're talking about blatantly transphobic um, speech, more often than not, sometimes homophobic, sometimes biphobic, but largely transphobic at the minute. Um, and actually, 
uh, and actually delegitimizing the very identities of LGBT um, people, which is just not up for debate. That's not something that we can debate in public institutions. Why? Because they're enshrined in law and have been, trans identities have been enshrined since 2004, reaffirmed in the Equality Act in 2010. Um, and I think there's something about power as well. Mm. So I'm, today I'm supporting a member, I'll, I'll be remotely, but I'm supporting a member of my team who does a part-time course in the evenings uh, post-grad. Um, and she spent 30 minutes um, arguing with her lecturer uh, in front of everyone um, about why what this lecturer was saying was transphobic. Um, and there was a recent, I say recent, probably about a year ago now, there was a statement made by a vice chancellor of um, a particular notable institution, um, mentioning no names, um, that said that um, LGBT students should should just debate with um, people, with with people, members of staff who are students who are homophobic, biphobic, or transphobic, or say homophobic, biphobic, transphobic things. And I think what that really flies in the face of is the massive power imbalance and the emotional labour involved in doing so. This member of my team is in a really bad place at the moment because. <coughs> because they had to legitimise their identities in a public and humiliating kind of setting against somebody who's in a position of power and actually wields power over their, over their outcomes. Um, so like, I think that's entirely missing from the so-called academic freedom um, debate, and I think there's just huge amounts of nuance missing from that at the moment. Mm. Oh, I could run forever about it. That's <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to open up to the floor. Is there anybody who would like to act, ask anybody on the panel any particular question or whether you've read the report and got your own view or created that view already in terms of questions um, for the Stonewall panel? Any questions? Yes. The question about um, intersectional issues really and what that means in practice, for obviously it can mean different things for institutions and for Stonewall, say, but, but what kinds of collaboration are required in order to address in particular those, those particular acute statistics, be it ethnicity, disability, class? Yeah, I think there's loads of things. I think there's something about um, culture and communities. In the Home and Communities report, um, we looked at the extent to which people of different identities are um, embraced, included um, within LGBT communities themselves. This isn't something we have historically liked to shine a light on because obviously our, our mission is that we're an LGBT charity and we're not, we're not there to, to shame LGBT communities, but at the same time, we need to be self-critical as LGBT communities and really assess whether we are inclusive of gay people, of religious people, and um, of other identities, of you know, socio-economic and class. Um, because we found that actually, like many LGBT networks, societies, groups, um, have been systematically exclusive in some of those respects. In particular, um, there were a horrendous amount of um, uh, of reported racist. Um, and behaviours and, and, and experiences um, from the AME LGBT um, people in the home, homes and communities reports. So I think there's something there about culture, but I think another thing, um, I'm sorry to make it kind of kind of boring and, <laughs> and, and stayed, but I, I really think data is quite important. Mm. So as an institution that should really be collecting, monitoring data on your staff and your students, look at where that where those identities intersect and identify the precise and acute actual issues that people are, are experiencing. Is it to do with um, bias within recruitment um, processes, for example? Is that why is that why you don't have, you know, very prominent LGBT game, you know, kind of staff? Is there something about um, clubs and societies, um, you know, can you monitor kind of engagement in those or satisfaction at least, you know, what what can we learn about these these distinct and precise um, experiences of um, overlapping um, identities. There's no there's no real catch-all answer for that because I think the I think the inequalities are, exist in a myriad of ways. That's really fascinating because I think at staff level we certainly are asking questions around data and monitoring, but what we then do with it in terms of intersectional kind of 
aggregation is is probably questionable. So I think that's really yeah. It's never analysed. It's never. Like they never. And they I never think, put across each other. And I know, and I think I'm a firm believer. If you're asking people for their personal data and information, there has to be a reason why. Otherwise, don't don't ask the case. So, so I think we all have a duty to actually be quite open and upfront about why we're asking the data, but then uh, then seriously looking at uh, what the instance is and whether there's a correlation in terms of harassment, bullying, and cultural change work that we should be doing in relation both for the student population and the staff and the whole university community. Because I suspect that that there are actually similarities for both staff members and students in terms of feeling silenced, feeling having to be visible and, and what those, those issues are. So I think more joint working um, um, LGBTQ CAM is certainly giving us a platform to be able to do that is, is really important. Nikki? I, I was just going to say, I also think it can be incredibly useful and actually quite enlightening perhaps in terms of our own unconscious biases or those of our colleagues, certainly in a lot of the work we did, the message that we got back from colleagues about their reluctance to make the curriculum more inclusive in terms of LGBTQ issues was very often we have a large number of international students on this programme or this module and we're, you know, we're concerned about how that will play out. The statistics that we gathered suggested, and, and there's, there's an element of caution here because it's optional as to whether students disclose their gender and sexual diversity to us, often for very good reasons. But what it suggested was, albeit in rather small numbers, that actually there was a higher proportion of LGBT identified students amongst our international students than there was amongst our home student population. And I think that that does link to some of the issues of yep. visibility. And yep. students were saying, we chose to come here either because we saw this as a, a country or a city where we could be quite open about who we are, or because we saw that you'd got a, an LGBTQ society, or we could do modules on these issues. And so I think it can also be useful not just in us understanding what the issues are, but presenting a challenge to colleagues who are perhaps more reticent and reluctant to, to respond to those issues. When I say it's never analysed, it's almost never analysed. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the University of Birmingham. <laughs> 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 Rob, is there anything we can learn from the NUS campaigning in terms of intersectionality and, and specifically? Because I think that's a key area which I think we, yeah, we need to improve on. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think um, I'm really proud of the industry that um, the NUS LGBT plus campaign specifically has on working with the, the phrase that we use is QTPOC. So QTPOC. Cutie Poc. Poc. It's an acronym. So queer, trans, intersex, people of colour. Okay. Um, as that's the, the term that like the self-defining members of our caucus um, chose on. Um, so we have lots of resources that we like constantly throw at student activists on the ground because like our priority is supporting those grassroots spaces yeah. and the development of those grassroots spaces. Um, but again, when um, in, in our report that we did in 2015, I, um, a phrase that really sticks to mind in, ref in reference to Cutie Park and, and LGBT plus people of colour is the climate of fear that they refer to um, when entering these really cliquey, very white, often very cis and gay spaces that are supposed to be the space if you are LGBT plus. Yeah. Um, and so something we really, really encourage is students and also like anyone who's involved in LGBT plus organising one in education institutions is to check out our resources that have been created by LGBT plus people of colour. Um, because often we find in, in our student spaces that um, we often celebrate that we talk about trans women of colour like building the foundations of our, of our movement um, and that's the only time we ever really mention trans women of colour is when we talk about as if, as if they kind of don't exist anymore like you know Stonewall was a riot but like we don't really know where those people are now and it's like well, trans women of colour still exist they are an extinct species yeah. um, we need to be like holding that liberation right at the heart of our organising yeah taking that forward. Thank you. Tasha? Um, you know, I was just actually thinking of the work of uh, Naz and Matt, um, mm -hmm. mentioned on that, on that um, issue. I don't know if you kind of collaborate yeah. with, with them, but um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I think a lot of these spaces are still um, predominantly, in, in, a lot, in a lot of ways, kind of quite homogenous, um, predominantly white. 
t I, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's difficult. The, the Fly campaign here at Cambridge have done some work, some work on, on this. Mm -hmm. I think um, what uh, Andrew's uh, mentioning before about these kind of intersectional sort of collaborations that are, that are required, is it a, is it a question of um, supporting some, some of these spaces? So that, that is kind of an exclusively sort of women of color uh, space. Um, and it, is it a question of you know fostering those those spaces? I suppose it's, it's fostering and then uh, also creating spaces of, of kind of interaction and, and collaboration as as well. And mm. um, I think what can happen, and it, perhaps this is a lo local even more so here than maybe at other universities, is this is the fragmentation within the colleges of the different societies that there are yep. um, across the university, the different kind of the, the work that's going on. And I think it's key that we communicate. Uh, as, as staff and with with KUSU, with KUSU the student union, um, and yeah, make sure that we're engaging with a lot of those those societies, societies really. And also from the equality and diversity, uh, yes, you yeah. know, from the university perspective, this is Black History Month. But you know, where are we in terms of the LGBTQ voice within that? Do you know what I mean? So I'm just thinking out loud. There's, there's a couple of events happening, but do you know what I mean? Where, where's the voice? So it, it's not. It's looking at equalities holistically as well, and looking at increasing confidence in our reporting of um, thinking big pieces of work that needs to happen in terms of harassment and bullying um, within within. I mean, it's front line, front page headlines in terms of um, within academia. But actually, these are these are particular points in case where we can raise profile and visibility mm -hmm. and look at how we holistically um, support work on that as a as a as a community mm -hmm. and, as well. Thank you. Less, less of me, more of you. Um, yeah. I mean, um, so just there's a. It, I, I raise this partly because it's a hole that the university staff network fell into when we did the survey two years ago. When you're asking people, are they out or do they disguise who they are, that kind of thing, are you also asking whether they actually? Some people with our, within our community have a much more meaningful choice about being out than others. And are you looking at that? And are you looking at, at whether the people who are out because they don't have anywhere to be, to go that's in, are more likely to experience it? Are you looking at the overlap? Does that, do you see what I mean by the question? Yeah. Is that, is that something you are or would like to look at? I think, speaking candidly, I'd, it's something I think I'd like us and I think we should be looking at it. I think Rob made some really important points about the nuances of being out, how there are different implications of what even being out means, um, especially for trans and non-binary um, staff and students. And I think I think those statistics I think are useful because they paint an image, but I think they're quite blunt statistics that potentially cover um, a few different potential issues and they're also quite loaded as well there's an extent there's an implication there that everybody should be out and what do we even mean by out do we mean out about your gender like or do we mean out about identifying as trans for example do you know what i mean there's a kind of like two different things so so i think like your point is really is a really valid one basically in that it's not a very nuanced start um and i and i certainly recognize that and i think and I think if we were to do further research about is HE specific, I think it would be interesting to break that down exactly how you do that from a methodological perspective. I'm not too sure, maybe that's a conversation for us to have with, with NUS. Um, but yeah, but I, but I think nonetheless they serve as quite powerful stats to paint a, an image, however blunt and unnuanced, about what is about everyday life. Mm -hmm. I don't know, does that answer your question? You're yeah, right, you're it's right. Sort of, it's basically. something like we've debated, sort of, do you need to. You, you almost need to ask people kind of sort of three questions like are, do you have a choice about being out yeah do you, is this something you reveal by making a decision to say something at a point in a relationship or is it revealed by you walking into a room and you know if if you know if no to the first two then do you do you disguise and like we certainly miss that trick quite badly and, made that data less useful and, as you say, more blunt. 
Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. <laughs> there are always more opportunities for more surveys. Yeah. But yes. So, <laughs> so I'm conscious of time when we have some other questions. Yes, from the back. Um, the full speaker mentioned this issue of um, where to draw the line in terms of um, homophobic or so hate speech. I'm just interested to know a bit more about what the report says on that. So things like, you know, where there is, for example, a sincerely held but respectfully put across view about perhaps more religious bits or other about gay marriage or the right to adopt. I mean, you know, how, how is that line drawn? Is that to me? Is I think that's to you, Pete, yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah so that's always like a million dollar question, but I, but I think anything that, um, and this isn't what you're talking about, but I think anything that threatens or intimidates um, people on grounds of their um, identities is clearly unacceptable and, um, and, um, and guarded against in law. That's not really what you're talking about. You're talking about academic debates. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about hate speech. I'm yeah. About where, for example, there might be a panel that's, that's where, for example, one speaker is giving forward a, a respectfully put, but religious, you know, a, 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 perhaps a religious view on, say, whether gay marriage should or should not be present, that, that kind of thing. I, I think, think hate speech can appear respectable. That, that's just just to, to, to add that. Sorry, oh, I'm yeah. responding, but it, it can, it, in the guise of, the, of an objective, respectable tone, there can be hidden still hate. I, I, I think that's a super important point. I was going to say, like, kind of, what do we mean when we say respectable? Because I, because we hear, because there's lots of organisations like, um, like a woman's place, for example, at the moment that are saying we want a really like respectful conversation about this, and then bam, the first thing that they'll say is essentially trans women are women. And like that's that's not a respectful debate because you have immediately um, denied the existence of somebody's um, identity. So I'd say so I'd say that is probably it's not limited to, but I would say that's certainly one of the key things that I would um, look out for. And if you're kind of adjudicating that, I think I think it's fair to say that if, if anybody's identity is um, actively and purposefully erased or um, or denied. Erased. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Or, or denied the um, existence of. Um, I think that's no longer a respectful debate. And I think, as, yeah. as you said. Do you have something to say here? Yes. yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry. 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 Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> Rob, yeah. over to you. Thank you. Um, I think, like, in terms of, like, the student, as the student representative, um, like, something that we often forget is in, like, nine out of ten cases where we're talking about, like, no platforming and free speech, what we're talking about students' unions, and I think it's really important to remember that students' unions are unions in the same way that trans women are women. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and um, like, so students' unions are unions, and what I mean by that is they're democratically owned, they're owned by the students, that's why like, I love them so much, like, we have power over our spaces in the same way that um, a member of university staff should have ownership over their workspace, students have ownership over their education space. And so when um, someone is being no platform, that isn't a couple of students like shouting down and saying, actually, we don't want this hate speech on our campus. We don't want to be debating over whether trans women are women because this is our home. This is our place of learning and place of education. And it's really frustrating, especially when um, lots of TERFs, so like big transphobes who pretend to be feminists, um, we'll talk about, um, you know, our, my, my free speech is being denied, I'm being denied a platform, and they have like five million followers on Twitter, they probably like <laughs> write in The Guardian every other weekend, I'm like, these students like, are not taking anything away from you, like, you are fine, you probably have like four books, like, you don't need to speak in that students' union with like, there's going to be like 50 people there, like, you are fine, and I think that's something that's really important to remember when we're talking about, like, free speech and who who actually needs those platforms in the first place, like academics usually don't need them. Nikki, do you have a response to that? Can you see me sitting okay, here? Okay, I can see you. What do I think about this? Um, I, don't, I don't disagree with anything you've said, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we, in terms of actually thinking about that question, in the research we did, we, we did make a distinction but I want to clarify and qualify this in a minute. We made a distinction between homophobia, transphobia, and homonegativity and transnegativity, and we, we classified what we meant by that. That doesn't mean that I think what we would class as negativity, such as the sort of debates that you're suggesting around, you know, a religious um, opposal of gay marriage, 
don't have an impact and as you pointed out it's mental health day it does have an impact on lgbtq people but those negative discourses wherever they come from do have an impact on people but we did make that distinction um, so, so that's the first thing. I think it is helpful to some extent to make those distinctions simply because it's a way of demonstrating that we're not just talking about really overt discrimination, but actually that much more subtle, often structural and organisational discourses can have just as much impact and it's, it's important to be able to think about that and demonstrate that. Um, <coughs> I get really uh, muddled up personally about some of the debates around, um, uh, and this is not to go against the trans women or women, but part of me also wants to be able to say, and I'm not sure I always feel comfortable saying it, and this is probably not the time to do it, was <laughs> it's at 1.30, but trans women's experience are different and need to be understood as different to some other women's experiences. And, and I do sometimes feel concerned that the current climate is closing down spaces for that conversation, which I think is a really important conversation. And as a feminist, I'd say patriarchy is embedded in all of that, but not necessarily in the same way. So I think that's an important conversation for us still to be able to have. And over to me, it is now <laughs> Sorry. 32 minutes, um, 32 minutes, it's, it's um, I think as a feminist also my experience is very different to as a Welsh woman, as a Welsh lesbian woman, it is very different to a Welsh person of colour who is, do you know what I mean, but I think that doesn't, um, yes I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but there are many experience. there are many experiences and we're not, we're not one community, but we are here to, to, safeguard the rights of our community members, whoever they may be. And that's, uh, I think that's a very important thing, thing to state. And I think, um, I think these are issues that we will continue grappling with because, because we're human and because we don't want patriarchy to win. Because I think that the division and the polarization means that who's laughing? Do you know what I mean? Is, yeah. is patriarchy and that's where the power exists. So that's, that's my. That's how I'm going to end it as, as, as chair. But what I would like to say is huge thank you to all of you for coming. You've been absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you to the panel members and to Pete and all of you for, for travelling this way and to giving your insights. And we want to continue debate and discussion. We have a new work website that Heather and Sarah have put together. If you haven't looked on it and used it, do so. LGBTQ at CAM. Dot .sociology.com.org. Dot .sociology, there we go. And also, um, for those of you um, who haven't received your university E&D flyer for Michaelmas term, pick it up on the way out. That's a hint for me to go and stand at the back and, and make sure there's a pile there. There is an LGBT staff welcome event happening on the 31st um, of October. Um, so please do come along um, to that. And we also have a trans awareness session on the 21st of November, the day after trans Trans, trans Day, thank you, Day for Remembrance um, on that day. And also to just let you know that Divinity have also got a huge amount of activities um, happening during that, that week, which will also hopefully be promoted on both of our websites as well. So lots going on. And at this point, I would also like to do a quick introduction of ask Andrew, who is our new university uh, champion for LGBT issues, just to give us um, a, a wave, a standard. So, uh, so we have, um, Andrew has taken over the role from Nick Bampos, who has completed that role for 10 years at the university, but certainly Andrew is going to be representing all of our views in terms of the uh, E&D committee for the university and taking forward a champion role at high PBC level or influencing the, the pro vice chancellor. So do, do contact me obviously as well as the staff network, which is a conduit for concerns, but do feel free to contact me personally. Because because we're here, we're greater, yes, we're greater in strength together than we are divided. Round of applause, I think.
says Snowy. Um, this one's very comfy. One very comfy. And we have a charm card um, here as well. And um, the nice thing about teaching to be converted is that you can actually be with loads of queer people in the same space and that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you come to our events. Thank you. Thank you.